discussion to about 40 minutes, and then there's 20 minutes for questions at the end. If you want to submit a question, there is a Q&A function. It's different to the comments function. So if you could put your questions on the Q&A function, and I'm told you can configure your Zoom to do it anonymously, if that's how you feel about your question. Um, apparently we can also tally votes for the most popular question, but I regret to inform you that isn't a prize today. We're gonna to be sending a digest of today's webinar to you tomorrow, so you don't have to take notes if you don't want to. And uh, accompany that we webinar, uh, that accompany the notes will be an audio file of the whole recording. Um, I am Philip Hackett QC. I'm a barrister at the 36 Group. I'm part of the commercial team. We're a London-based chambers with offices in Singapore and Cyprus as well. I'm the head of the 36 Commercial Crime Practice Group within the 36 Group. Um, in today's webinar, I'm going to try and draw on recent experience of actual cases that I've appeared in. Uh, I'm joined and assisted today by Rachel Muldoon. Rachel's a barrister at 36 Commercial. She's also part of the 36 Commercial Crime Team. She has a commercial crime practice, started in pure white collar crime, and now has a versatile practice combining this experience with cyber, contract, tax, and other areas of law. Now we're going to uh, structure things as follows. First of all, we're going to deal with the applicable legislation. Um, we're going to deal with the substantive tests for obtaining an AFO. But, but I want to stress that today is not about reading the legislation to you or trailing through guidelines and, and codes of practice. Um, after we've gone through the substantive law, I'm going to discuss the targeting of foreign nationals with a particular look at, at Chinese citizens and Chinese students by the regulatory authorities in this, con in this country with these interim freezing orders. We're then going to look at the ways that these orders can be challenged. We're gonna follow that by looking at the appeal procedure. And then finally, compensation, damages and remedies on the discharge of the interim order. As I say, we're not concerned with, with theoretical matters and uh, examining what Parliament said, um, but it does seem clear to me that this legislation is being used in a way that was not envisaged when it was passed in part of the Criminal Finances Act. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Rachel, who's going to talk to you about some of the nuts and bolts of the legislation. Thank you, Philip. Count freezing orders, <clears throat> or AFOs as we shall refer to them, are interim orders distinct from final account forfeiture orders that allow for various authorities, such as the Serious Fraud Office, National Crime Agency, <clears throat> to freeze funds in a subject's bank or building society accounts. If successful, an account freezing order will prohibit the account holder or any person for whom the account is operated from making withdrawals or payments from the account which the order applies. Now an account is operated by or for any person who is uh, the account holder or signatory or is identified as a beneficiary in relation to that account. The maximum duration for which an account freezing order can be sought is two years running from the date of the order. Minimum uh, threshold applies to account freezing orders, so there must be at least £1,000 within the respective account. IFOs are a relatively new beast. They came into force, as we know, on the 31st of January of 2018. They were introduced, as Philip says, under the Criminal Finances Act 2017, the CFA, along with the much more glamorous cousin, unexplained wealth orders. 
CFA inserted uh, a number of provisions into part five of the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, or POCA. And so an account freezing order is a civil remedy or civil recovery mechanism rather. Now for the purposes of an account freezing order, only a, a group of, of sections are actually relevant here. So it's sections 303Z1 to Z8 and Z18 to 19 of POCA. Rules that govern account freezing orders can be found in the magistrate's court freezing and forfeiture of money in bank and building society account rules 2017 and uh, Philip and I shall refer to these as the rules. I will address the test for obtaining an account freezing order uh, as we go on in this webinar. Before I do, Philip, based on your experience of defending the subjects of these applications, what is their intended purpose? And can you shed any light on any prosecution tactics? Uh, I'm not going to go into the intended purpose in, in any detail, but all the attention when the legislation was passed was on the unexplained wealth orders. And no one seems to have looked at this or discussed it very much. Um, but of course, it, it's much easier to get into this test than with other forms of poker orders, restraint in the Crown Court, because the police or the regulator does not have to have commenced an investigation. This can be a very, very, very preliminary activity. But that doesn't mean it's any less devastating to the subject who gets their accounts frozen, possibly their, their business and their life ruined, certainly their financial reputation ruined, and their relationship with their bank or banks is likely to become very difficult indeed. This almost summary type of procedure appears to avoid many of the previous safeguards on asset restraint um, orders. I'd call it a shortcut. And the practical uh, consequence is often that it ends up with a fairly junior police officer, and I apologize to junior police officers who've been delegated to do this, but it ends up with a fairly junior police officer giving an account which then is taken by a financial investigator and presented to a district judge, usually in London anyway, in the magistrate's court. Now the form itself is highly unsatisfactory. The application form is largely a set of tick boxes. So if you wish to contend that there is nothing that you should disclose to the court under your duty, a full and frank disclosure, you just tick a box. And it seems to me that's, that's led to a number of, of mistakes and errors um, because it's just too easy for the financial investigator to do this. And striking a contrast with applications in the Crown Court in particular for things like search warrants, the facts on which the application is based comes in what is usually called an information or a statement and is not necessarily sworn, although an investigator and officer will adopt it in court and confirm it. It seems to me that it's a weakness that the declaration of truth is being made by uh, an investigator, a financial investigator, and the facts are being produced separately by a police officer. Far as I can see, there is no legal oversight of these applications. The statutory test is for, for instance, in the case of the police, for a senior officer, usually an inspector, to sign it off. We don't know how much that inspector may or may not know. We don't know how much time he may have spent on it. But certainly when you see applications with five to 10 minutes reading time and five to 10 minutes court time, they're gonna end up with millions and millions of pounds being frozen and catastrophic financial damage. Uh, it seems to me this summary form of procedure is unsatisfactory. Rachel, what's the statutory test for obtaining an AFO? An application for uh, an AFO is made pursuant to section 303Z1 of POCA, with the test appearing at section 303Z3. So the application is made to the magistrate's court, as you say, by an enforcement officer. Uh, and this can include uh, an officer of revenue and customs, a constable, an SFO officer or an accredited financial investigator. In the case of the enforcement officer, they must either be a senior officer 
or authorised by a senior officer. Now, the application must be made in writing. This is provided for under Rule 3 of Section 1 of the rules. But as a first step, as I said, the court must be satisfied that the credit balance of the account is at least £1,000. Thereafter, test for securing an AFO is as follows. That the court must be satisfied on the balance of probabilities. There are reasonable grounds for suspecting that the money held in the relevant account, whether all or in part of the credit balance, is either recoverable property or intended by any person for use in lawful, unlawful conduct. Now, I'll very briefly examine the three elements of this test and turning first to recoverable property. As we know, the concept of recoverable property runs throughout the Proceeds of Crime Act. This is defined as property obtained through unlawful conduct, unless, of course, it has been obtained by an innocent third party in good faith for value without notice. Turning to unlawful conduct, it is given its statutory meaning at sections 241 and 242 of POCA. And in short, this is conduct by the person subject to the order, or in fact, anyone. There is, uh, of course, a nexus between the conduct and the property. So it has either been obtained directly by the conduct or in return for it. And as a litmus test, it is conduct that, if committed in the United Kingdom, would be contrary to the criminal law of England and Wales. Now, crucially, there is no requirement for the applicant to prove the account holder is involved in the suspected unlawful conduct, or for there to even be, as you say, an investigation underway. This element of the attest is, is therefore easily proven for the civil standard, particularly considering the allowance under POCA for a general assumption of money laundering to be made without the need for the applicant to specify the predicate offence. Finally, reasonable grounds to suspect on the balance of probabilities is all that is required. This burden of suspicion is a significantly low bar when compared with restraint orders in the Crown Court requiring reasonable grounds to suspect that the alleged offender has benefited from their criminal conduct and a good and arguable case for property freezing orders in the High Court. This is the most problematic area within the context of account freezing order applications, given the very low bar and threshold test, particularly because of these two factors. Firstly, such a suspicion tends to arise following the submission of a suspicious activity report, which, let's face it, are not always the most reliable or detailed of documents. And uh, AFOs, unlike restraint orders, are available even where an investigation has not commenced, calling into question the extent of the evidence in fact relied upon at this preliminary stage. So the result is that the majority of applications for account freezing orders are approved by the Magistrates Court. Now, Philip, would you mind providing us with some insight into your experience of how the authorities have been relentlessly targeting foreign nationals in particular in applying for account freezing orders? Well, well, it's my experience that these summary proceedings, the lack of inquiry, um, have impacted disproportionately and particularly hard on foreign citizens living in the UK. And the problem and the solution both lie in the applicants, the regulators, duty of full and frank disclosure uh, when they apply for the order. Um, and not only does that cause the problem, but it's likely to be when eventually the defendant comes back to court, it's likely to be the solution. Because if you think about it, it's very, very difficult for the applicant for any order from the Crown Court, from the High Court, from the Magistrates Court to comply with that duty of full and frank disclosure in terms of a foreign target, a foreign defendant. Because we know that the regulators almost certainly already been to a bank 
and will have obtained some evidence from a bank. As Rachel says, the whole thing may have started with a report from a bank. But if you're going to make allegations against a foreign citizen that they're living in a particular way, they're spending in a particular way, their source of income is not known, then you're under a duty to make it clear to the court that there are accounts that go overseas. There are areas that have not been investigated. They're just at the start of their investigation. There may be other explanations for this money. There is a whole gap of overseas activity that the applicant has got to make clear to the court it hasn't had a chance to investigate yet. And I'll take some typical examples. And I've seen one particular one in three cases now. There's a lot of um, flashy evidence produced about the extravagant lifestyle and high spending of the defendant. This is immediately followed by an assertion by the deposing officer investigator that the HMRC, with whom checks are clearly being made, have no records of any income or minimal income. And the implication is that there could be no other explanation but that it's crime. But if you've got a foreign resident, and, and to take an example, a number of Russian residents of London have suffered from this, um, there may be any number of explanations. And one would hope that a court that had that sort of contention put before it would immediately say, well, well so what? What can I draw from that? Should this foreign resident of London actually be registered with HMRC? Does that mean anything at all? And yet, despite that, I've actually not seen an example of where in the ex parte hearing, a court has taken up the applicant on that. I just make a point about that. You will, of course, be entitled to get the court notes. You'll almost certainly get some where it's been a magistrate type application. You may be surprised in some Crown Court applications that no notes have been taken. Uh, the applicant, the investigator, whichever agency they are, certainly should be taking notes of what happens in the hearing. You may be surprised because often one officer goes on their own and no one takes a note of what's said in the witness box. And that's, uh, that's very, very poor practice if you think of the seriousness of, of what's happening in these applications. Uh, another allegation one sees frequently is the use of cash, the spending of cash. It just so happened that in some cultures they like cash. To take an example out of this country, uh, I, I'm aware of a situation in, in another capital city somewhere else where when people went to buy cars, £150,000 equivalent, um, they drew the cash out and they took the cash to the car showroom because that's what they wanted to do. Because you have cash, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a criminal. And if you put together the allegation of nothing with HNRC, no known form of income and cash, I don't think a court should accept that without asking, is there any other possible explanation? But in those cases, too often I've seen the nothing to, no, no, no um, disclosure to be made under the duty. Just the box ticked and nothing further. I did see one case where there was disclosure meant. And after um, pages and pages of allegations of suspicion of criminal conduct, all of which turned out to be complete nonsense and without any proper foundation, in discharge of that duty, a police officer had written, well, they're clearly part of an organized criminal gang, but I can't say that they're in charge of it. And that was thought to be a sufficient discharge of the duty on the officer to be fair and to put whatever the respondents might have put had they been there in court. Now, what we know from the most serious cases, like ex parte Rawlinson, the Chengiz case, is that um, this duty of disclosure is taken very, very seriously in much larger cases in the higher courts. And although I think Rachel would tell us there's nothing in the codes of practice about this, and there is no code of practice covering this, um, the courts have got to take this duty much more seriously because they are regulating quite junior and often quite inexperienced officers in this. I want to say now about a recent impact on a particular group of foreign residents in the UK and it's Chinese citizens. 
Um, when this legislation first came in, there was a burst of about 60 cases in a week. They may have been well placed. They were nearly all students. They had huge sums of cash. And the situation several years ago may be that Chinese citizens, students in particular, thought it was a good idea to get a better rate in bureau de change by having their money telegraphed, take it out in cash, but then some of them fed it back into English banks. That's obviously a bad idea, and I, I think it's probably not happening in the same way. And one can understand why that gave cause for alarm to, to regulators. Um, but it led to assumptions. And I'll take an example. There is a policy document uh, that's on a regulator's website dealing with so-called Daigu banking, which is a system of money laundering, apparently, by buying luxury goods with cash, taking the luxury goods back to your home country and converting them, selling them there. Um, but in that document, there are a police document that is published and clearly will be read by the investigators who make these applications. There's an assumption that if you're young, extremely rich and Chinese, well, there's probably something illegal going on here. It's very clear in the document. I've made representations about it being a breach of human rights. I've yet to have a client who would like me to challenge the use of that document in its publication. But I think it is clearly leading to Chinese citizens being treated at a disadvantage and assumptions being made against them that should not be made. And you get particular examples. So in the application, someone, I think the regulators have probably got checklists for these documents. Um, someone has pointed out that you can't take out more than $50 a year in, from China in currency without special permission. And this is presented in applications as though anyone who's spending more than $50,000 must be engaged in criminal activity. Um, and I've seen it put before courts, and I've never seen a court take the correct point, which is, this is not an offence in this country of itself. If that is a Chinese currency regulation, it's not a matter that an English court can make a freezing order over. But I've also seen that point. I've seen it made in three cases. I've seen it made in a case where the police had the bank statements and the money actually came from Hong Kong. It didn't come from China at all. So I wonder where the supervision was there. Um, there are other, other assumptions that are made. There are a number of Chinese young people and students who are spending very large amounts of money and the police put this in. So I've seen a case where the application says, well, they've got two or three cars and they're worth 200,000 pounds each um, they're spending a quarter of a million pounds on luxury goods, and it's all presented as though it must necessarily lead to an inference of criminality. However, the police have failed to point out that these are young people receiving millions of pounds from their family, and not just from China, from Hong Kong, and from other various offshore jurisdictions. And I suppose the greatest disappointment to me is that courts have not been more inquisitive about this before making these orders. So, Rachel, is there a, a code of practice or something in the magistrate's court rules to regulate the ex parte hearings for these orders? Well, Philip, uh, the rules make no provision for without notice applications. Um, however, we would, of course, contend, wouldn't we, that the duty on applicants, the duty they owe, is clearly spelt out in the many well-travelled areas of criminal and civil law. And there is, of course, more than adequate law regarding unexplained wealth orders, warrants and the like dealing with this. So the, the avenue, of course, is there to bring an ex parte application under the test at section 303Z1, subsection 4, uh, this being where, uh, in the circumstance of the case, a notice of the application would prejudice the taking of steps under part 3b of, of POCA, forfeit money that is recoverable or intended uh, by any person for use in unlawful conduct. But no, there is an avenue certainly to, to make such an ex parte application, but no code of conduct per se, no rules. We must not forget, however, 
the applicant is, of course, subject to the civil procedure and civil disclosure rules and is under a duty to provide, as you say, full, fair and accurate disclosure of material facts to the court. Should the applicant fail in this duty of full and frank disclosure, this will likely provide a lifeline, won't it, Philip, for the order subjects in that they may rely on this in order to have the order set aside or varied under Section 303Z4 of POCA. So whistle stop tour, but the answer is no, I'm afraid, Philip. I'll now pass the baton back to you to address the main points of challenge. Yes, Rachel, it, it is surprising. This particular order, draconian or not, seems to have slipped, slipped under the consideration of those passing the legislation and enforcing it. Um, one can compare very unfavorably the application form for an interim AFO, freezing order, with, for instance, application forms uh, under poker in the Crown Court for warrants and for restraint orders, where the body of the application form requires much more consideration to be given and for the person who is adducing the relevant facts to depose to the truth of them. Um, in this situation, if you're relying on some esoteric argument about what reasonable suspicion means, if you're relying on some 30 year old uh, Privy Council case, you are unlikely to be successful. However, if you can rely upon breach of duty in the ex parte hearing, there is a body of law, not just ex parte rule in some, but a whole body of law that really emphasizes the duty. And of course, one of the remedies for breach of that duty is the order is discharged per se, irrespective of what might otherwise be the merits. And I have sometimes had prosecutors, investigators, regulators who've said, well, we agree we didn't say this, we didn't say that, and we could have said certain things differently, but we had a great case anyway. That very, very rarely succeeds with the court. And I think that respondents are the subject of these orders where there is a breach of the duty in the ex parte hearing can and need and are fully justified in going in strong and they shouldn't hesitate and the emphasis in court switches to the applicant to explain themselves. And for various reasons we'll go into, for technical reasons in, in these type of, of applications, it's just about impossible for the um, applicants to explain themselves once those breaches of the duty are disclosed. And I'll give an example. We all know that there are special rules for informants, for relying on information. And it, in all areas of law, it can't be relied upon that corroboration. And particularly in this type of an application, you've got to have corroboration. Too often I've seen examples of the corroboration either not being dealt with in the application or something stupid being given. So the informant, and I know there are informants in the Chinese community in London who who, who are working with regulatory authorities will say something like, well, they've got two or three big expensive cars and they live in a big expensive house. So the investigator goes along surreptitiously and finds two or three big cars and a big house and puts that in the formal application as the corroboration of the informant. But of course, it corroborates nothing at all. What you need is corroboration of the criminal allegations. And again, I say it's quite disappointing to me that on a subject such as corroboration, which should be for the judge, and should be for the court, they've not picked that one up straight away. Um, I, I just want to say something else about the challenges. They are limited in the magistrate's court, but you're not limited on these to the magistrate's court. You can bring various forms of civil actions. We'll talk about judicial review. You've got right to go in the QBD. Um, there are human rights issues here, and although the essence of this is a forensic exercise which takes to pieces the facts relied upon in the information and the application, there are also breaches of Article 8 here, the right to family life, and Article 14, 
because these orders in respect of a lot of foreign respondents are being sought and obtained on the basis of discrimination. And I believe that the Equalities Act, which wouldn't give a right action in the magistrate's court and you couldn't bring a human rights action in the magistrate's court, I, both, I think they both support various forms of civil action and they both cause the regulatory authorities to reflect long and hard before objecting to your challenge to these, um, to these orders. Um, Rachel, would you like to deal with compensation? Yes, Philip. Um, thankfully, compensation is available, uh, thankfully, under Section 303Z18 of the Act and is governed by the Magistrates' Court Rule 8. Um, so certainly a rule for compensation, but, but not for disclosure. Now, the court may order compensation to be paid to the applicant where following four conditions apply. Firstly, that an account freezing order is made. Uh, secondly, that uh, none of the money in the account to which the order applies is eventually forfeited. The third requirement is that the court is satisfied that the applicant has suffered loss as a result of the making of the order. And the final condition is that the circumstances are exceptional. The amount of compensation to be paid uh, is the amount deemed reasonable by the court having regard to the loss suffered and any other relevant circumstances. Finally, with regards to, to a nod to costs, these are recoverable in the usual way in the magistrates with the starting point being that the authority has acted properly and reasonably. Uh, and, and where this happens, there should be no order as to costs applying the principle in Perrin Panathem. So based on your recent cases, Philip, what is the practical position with regards to recovery of compensation and costs in actuality? Well, there are a number of different statutes that give a right to compensation where some order is set aside. Uh, because this is in the magistrate's court, there are no reported cases and it's very hard to get a handle on any precedent. But my impression was, and I've never had an order of the court, I've always settled it. My impression was the district judges involved were not thinking of particularly large numbers. And I got that impression when I saw their reaction to the costs involved. And one of the difficulties with this type of litigation is that for public policy and historic reasons, compensation damages for uh, orders that are granted and set aside, even where serious infringements such as warrants uh, and searches take place, the damages are quite low. And if you look in the civil jurisdiction, the Court of Appeal has been careful to set out criteria that keep the damages low. Um, but it's expensive to litigate these matters. Sometimes you're getting evidence from abroad. Um, the regulator does not come to these things easily. You have to have protracted hearings. You have to have protracted submissions. And the fact is that the costs are going to outweigh the potential compensation uh, in making such an application. But nevertheless, there are advantages in doing it because when the uh, regulator agrees by consent or when the court orders the order to be set aside, the full culpability of the regulator in obtaining that evidence and in non-disclosure in the ex parte hearing is not necessarily examined. And your client may still be facing some form of investigation, certainly questions about their finances. And if you really, really want to nail the regulator and nail their failure, it may be necessary to keep pursuing the matter for a hearing for compensation. Because the only way to explain what's happened in the application 
and to support what will no doubt be the, the submission of the regulator that um, this was an honest mistake. If you want to show it was at best wildly reckless and possibly quite worse, you're going to need to require evidence. Now, again, the magistrate's got not going to be that keen on that. They don't have a lot of time. You'll have a listing a long way ahead. But in my experience, the regulator is most unlikely to expose the investigator to giving a statement under oath in a witness statement explaining just how and why they came to make these uh, non-disclosures in the hearing. So there are a number of reasons why it's worth pursuing the uh, compensation application, but the very best outcome is to pursue it when you don't get the evidence and the witness statements from the regulator to settle the matter, you'll no doubt get a pretty low uh, sum as compensation, uh, and one that your client won't feel will compensate for the damage to their financial reputation and their banking relationships. But you can then get uh, costs, which will be taxed. And of course, the low level of the compensation will be a factor in that taxation. But you may even get your costs of the failed or set aside a, a freezing order application on an indemnity basis. Uh, in the application for compensation, even if you get it on a standard basis, you're going to be far better off than if the court makes an award of compensation because the magistrate's court has to assess the cost then and there and make a cost order in a defined sum. And going on their general experience in cases, they may be a bit shocked about what is in effect an international commercial. Overall, your client's going to be better off with a settlement if you can achieve that. And you may find the regulators more than open to it, depending on the sort of conduct you've alleged about the original obtaining of the order. Now, in going for that compensation, I think that if it's discharged as a result of non-disclosure or by agreement on your contention of non-disclosure, I don't see how that can be anything other than exceptional circumstances and meet the statutory test. You don't have to show default or even negligence. Showing malice or anything like that is out the window. You don't need it. What could be more out of the exception than to obtain a restraining order or a freezing order by non-disclosure? Now, I have seen skeleton arguments from regulators suggesting that, that their non-disclosure wasn't out of the ordinary, but they quickly reflected on that and decided they couldn't run that one in court. So I've never seen it tested in court, but I'm very confident that an order discharged by the court or by agreement for non-disclosure will be exceptional and your client can move on to the next stage, which is claiming the statutory compensation. Now you've got other options, um, but of course at this stage, many clients particularly the foreign clients, they've, they've got their bank accounts unfrozen, they've got their money back, they've got a decent order for costs, they've got compensation, um, they may even get an apology, a written apology, which is actually quite important to some clients. And a lot of people don't feel as though they want to carry on litigating at that point. And in my experience, quite a few of them don't feel they don't want to stay in this country. Uh, but there are other civil options. And I think we're going to talk at some point about uh, rights of appeal. Um, I, I don't know if that's going to come in the questions, Rachel, or if we're going to deal with that now. Rights of appeal, if in fact um, the court uh, refuses to discharge the order or set it aside. When are we going to deal with that? Yes, well, we, we might as well deal with it now. We certainly ha have the time. So. So yes, um, as you and I have discussed, Philip, the, the Act is very odd, uh, the relevant sections in POCA, because of course, while there is a statutory right of appeal of an account forfeiture order, by way of a de novo hearing to the Crown Court, the same can't be said for account freezing orders. It is simply limited to the statutory right to vary or discharge account freezing orders. And so therefore, a challenge of an account freezing order itself in respect of an application for its discharge or variation is appealable really only by way of either case stated or judicial review proceedings in the High Court. 
Yes, I, I agree. It's a lacuna in the statute. The final order under this section um, it, it is appealed to the Crown Court and it's completely silent on the interim order. I agree there's JR, but I also think that there is um, potential for civil action to the QBD here. But as I say, most clients want to escape the English legal system at this point. Can I finally, by way of summary, just say this? Um, regulators have a very bad habit now of publicizing what they think is a triumph. And so when the accounts are frozen, you may well find the regulator puts something on the website immediately. And my, even though they don't even have an investigation formally at this point, my experience is that they almost always say something that enables your client to be identified. And somehow or other, the press seem to find where your um, client is. It's amazing. It seems to happen so regularly. Um, there is no doubt now we have good authority following the Law Commission, um, following the Enrique's uh, report, following cases like uh, ZXC and Bloomberg, following Cliff Richard's case, that uh, publishing material that enables your client to be identified as a breach of their Article 8 rights, and they have a right to an action in damages, and I think that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, we're going to move on now to questions. Uh, before I do, I just want to mention that this is the first in our series. Uh, sometime early next month, we'll be having the second in our series, and the topic will be alleged fraud in arbitral proceedings, and the date of that will be published. So I don't know, and I haven't looked, if there are any questions. And I'm just going to put the Q&A on. And... Um, we do have a question indeed. Um, Rachel, do you want to deal with the first question or shall I? Let's have a look. So the question states, is judicial review a satisfactory procedure to challenge an interim account freezing order given the nature of the remedies available? Well, it, in the first instance, um, I'm afraid it's, it's only, as we said, one, one of two routes of, of appealing the interim order. Um, the remedies are are limited, aren't they? And so uh, I think you considered this precise point, didn't you, Philip, in, in one of your recent cases? I have. Um, I agree. It's not what one would think for an interim order, but you couldn't go to the Crown Court on it. The Crown Court's got no jurisdiction on it. And also, these things are quite fact-specific. They might be evidentially complex, and you would not be popular in the administrative court. But I'm, I'm not sure, I haven't had to get there because I haven't had this situation because the orders have been set aside by agreement or by the court's order. Um, but I can't see any other route open at the moment. And um, e even though the remedies are limited, I mean, you can, of course, you can, of course, attach a claim to damages for an action to judicial review. But I agree, it's not a natural fit at all. And it would be interesting, Philip. It would be interesting, Philip, wouldn't it, if uh, if someone were to appeal uh, one of these orders, an account freezing order, to the Crown Court. Uh, imagine what a Crown Court judge would make of that. I, I think they'd ask you to explain their jurisdiction immediately, and you wouldn't be able to, and you'd have a bit of a problem about having wasted everyone's time and money. I think. Right. Um, Let's see. Do we have any other questions? Don't be shy. Well, give it a few moments. Ah, here we go. Uh, do you think in judicial review, the Queen's Bench Division would be amenable to some form of interim relief? What do you think, Philip? Well, let's take an obvious and easy one. Uh, if you argue that um, the decision of the magistrate's court was procedurally unsound, Perhaps they simply hadn't asked the questions. Perhaps the right material had not been in front of them. Uh, perhaps the, um, the applicants hadn't complied with something. Perhaps they hadn't um, ticked the box about complying with their duty. So you could have some procedural flaw. Or you could say, in the light of 
the undisputed facts of the case, the decision was irrational. And even though the district judge didn't have the full facts before him at the time of the application, he had them before him at the time when the respondent applied to have the order discharged and he irrationally ignored it. I'll give you an example. Uh, the police say these wealthy young people have two million pounds in a bank account and they're not registered with HMRC and they have no business. However, the police failed to tell the court that in fact that bank account has received five million pounds from a completely legitimate and unquestioned source. And for whatever reason, the district judge might have overlooked that or failed to have proper regard to that when uh, that was brought to his attention in the challenge. To say I'm talking theoretically about all of this because it, it hasn't happened to me. I've never got beyond that first stage and the orders have all been discharged at that first stage. Just seeing, uh, I think we've had two further questions. We've, um, I'll just look at the, the most recent one. Will account freezing orders use be increased in future, bearing in mind the recent sanctions due to AML by UK government? Well, just addressing that, we've seen year on year a doubling of, um, of these kinds of applications. And uh, I believe, well, I've got the statistics uh, here, courtesy of uh, Bird and Bird, in fact, that from 2019 to 20 tax year, um, there were a grand total of 166 bank and building society accounts uh, frozen. And so this, uh, it only goes to show an upward trend. And uh, Philip, would you agree it's because, let's face it, that the low bar set uh, evidentially for, for meeting this, this, this test for an interim order, it makes it an irresistible route, does it not, to restrain funds for, for the maximum of two years? Well, I, I've referred several times to the summary nature of the procedure, which in my view is unsatisfactory, but that brings with it costs implications. And we all saw about six months ago when that unexplained wealth order was set aside and on the day it was set aside, in a matter where the, I think it was the NCA, were refused permission to appeal, the application in court, and remember these are civil proceedings, for interim costs resulted in an order from the judge of £500,000 as an interim award. And that leads some support to the suggestion that the total bill for the respondent was one and a half million pounds. Now, those of us who deal with regulatory agencies quite often will know how difficult it must be for them to go back to the office at lunchtime and say, we've got 14 days to pay 500,000 pounds. And one, one recalls after the Cengiz case, I think the, the SFO had to have some special funding. And we really shouldn't make jokes about winding the SFO up, but I think one reason that they might be concentrating on these orders is that in the magistrates court, there's very little prospect that those sort of cost orders are going to arise. Um, so they will be using them increasingly, but I hope they will be held increasingly to account and that there will be more oversight. And one of the difficulties is when things go badly wrong, like in ex party Rawlinson, there's a big inquiry into what's happened. But what I fear is when they're in the magistrate's court, there's no real examination and no accountability when things have gone wrong. Because if the respondent gets it happily set aside and gets on with their life as best they can, um, no one, I mean, unless the court makes any comments, which is unusual in my experience, unless the court makes a comment, this just goes away, it goes under the radar. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if the practice is changing. I don't know if they're going to put a lawyer in charge of these. So there is some proper consideration. And that's entirely right, Philip, that many of the uh, authorities, the applicants, hide behind the, the magistrate's court as a forum, don't they? Because as you and I know, there is limited time allotted, if any, to read the papers. Uh, and in addition to that, the chaotic nature of the court list means that very little oversight is given to these applications, particularly ex parte applications. Um, I've just seen another question, uh, just talking about appeal to the Crown Court. Can one argue that 
as there is a right of appeal from the Mass Court to the Crown Court anyway, does an appeal not lie to the Crown Court? Well, again, it's uh, being a civil application, isn't it, Philip? It's not, it doesn't necessarily follow. If anyone was interpreting this statute, they would say that in the case of a final order, the section specifically sets out there is a right of appeal. And we know from the, um, I think it's in the practice in, in the in magistrate's court rules, it is specified that that right of appeal is to the Crown Court. Now, I don't think you can infer a right of appeal. And um, where there is absolute silence, um, I just think you get to the Crown Court, and you'd be unable to justify it in any way. Can I just add something about the, the way these things are organized in court? Um, when you see the application, you often see that the court's being told it's five to 10 minutes reading and um, it's five to 10 minutes in court, which is quite shocking when you think of what's at stake here and it may be millions of pounds. And in whether these orders have been used correctly, the threshold is 1000 pounds in the account if you think the High Court threshold was £50,000, and one might have thought that the Magistrate's Court was to be used between the £1,000 and the £50,000, but we've all seen orders for millions and millions of pounds being made by the Magistrates. And we Philip, I appear to have missed one of the questions. Do yeah. you think there may be an action for damages, not necessarily for breach of the core articles of the Convention, to Article 1 of the first protocol regarding protection of property, peaceful yeah. enjoyment. It seems to me there would be. What do you think? There would be, but not in the Magistrates' Court. No. You, you can't bring a human rights action in the Magistrates' Court. Um, but it could be part of your judicial review and your substantive claim um, for, uh, uh, for review in, in the High Court. But having said all of that, one reason it hasn't occurred may be the practicalities. So you're going to make your application and the regulators are going to see they're in trouble because you wouldn't have made it unless it was meritorious. The regulators are going to see that they're in trouble and they're going to withdraw the application. And if they've got withdraw, agree to the agree to the order being set aside. And if they've got a decent case, they'll try and reformulate it and come back with it. But I don't think they would want to go on to resist JR in the High Court, partly because then they've got to put some evidence in. And as I say, my experience across five cases is those who've deposed to these facts, which have turned out to be completely unjustifiable by any standards, let alone the ex parte standards, have never been prepared to put in a witness statement explaining their, uh, their original evidence and the regulator has never been prepared to put in a witness statement by the senior officer or senior party who is supposed to have supervised this. So I've never got beyond this stage, so it's theoretical, and I don't see the regulator wanting to get to this stage either. See if we have any other questions. Let's see, we'll wait a moment. I, I've got one for you, Philip, um, and, and I'm sure everyone listening in with this is not a a setup and it'll come as much a surprise to Philip as, a, as any of you, but bearing in mind all we've said on account freezing orders, do you think their, their use, the, the increasing applications for them is simply just a negotiation tool? Do you think they're simply trying to apply pressure on, on these you know, poor students or otherwise um, in order to turn the screw of you on? No, I, I don't. I think it's completely misplaced power with inadequate protections that has been wrongly exploited and it's become systemic. So if you sweep up 60 students in, in a day on these, I mean, how's the court giving proper consideration to all these orders? And um, in a lot of issues to do with Chinese citizens and international commercial matters, cultural issues become important and different societies behave in different ways they have different relationships and i think that a lot of these applications are being made in ignorance without a proper consideration of what might be the explanation for why this extreme wealth is being displayed so visibly 
by these foreign visitors to our shores. Um, I'm, I, as, as you can tell, I, I've got a very dim view of how it's been used. Right. I think I we have to wrap up now. Can I do that by reminding everyone that um, you will get um, a copy of the summary and you'll get a copy of the recording and that we will be meeting again in a month's time and we'll be looking at the very interesting question of allegations of fraud in arbitral proceedings and that'll be on an international basis because we'll be looking at international commercial arbitration and the question of what fraud means in different legal systems and different cultures and what the response is. So that's it, Rachel. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending today. I hope you found our practical approach of assistance. And um, I hope we'll see you again in a month's time. <laughs>